Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for developmental. In this lecture, we are talking about genes and environment and my favorite, evolution. So we are going to look at evolution by natural selection. We'll look at a few other aspects of evolution. We'll look at genetics because that is directly relevant to this class and then we'll tie it all into evolution itself. So let's get right into it. So first, what we have to do is define evolution. So at this point, I would ask you to um, tell me what you think evolution is. And I'm not talking about evolution in living things. I'm just talking about evolution in general. I'm not talking about Darwinian evolution, evolution by natural selection. I'm just talking about evolution in general. So when we talk about evolution and we define it, evolution is just simply defined as change over time now when we're talking about it in terms of living things we're talking about change over time and living things but when we're talking about evolution we can incorporate it into things like um, evolution of machinery how machinery is changed over time that type of thing but specific to this class we're looking at living things so we're going to look at what evolution means in the context of living things so in the context of living things, evolution refers to change over time of the structures of living things. And it's important to note that many scientists, even before Darwin, especially a lot of things like geologists, embryologists, um, archaeologists that existed at the time, they, they suspected that evolution did occur. They, it's been known all the way back to um, Plato. And back even farther than that, for thousands of years, we've got writings that talk about how basically living things changed over time. Some of the earlier works talked about how speciation might occur, how one might become another, and, more, and others just referred to more within a species how that changed over time. And you, you do have to look at, at the history of humans as something where it's been known for a long time that evolution occurred because at least those minor changes within a species because before we modern times up for the last about 12,000 years humans were farmers and farmers understand it because they know that if they breed certain livestock together or they um, use certain types of let's say grains um, that they can select for traits that they like and that can be basically something that can happen over time so they had this idea of what that that evolution did occur however the the why or the the how it worked wasn't known and there were many theories um, the most popular one prior to Darwin was Lamarckian. So you might hear it called Lamarckian evolution. Lamarck, um, he talked about inheritance of acquired characteristics. What's important here is this word acquired because Lamarckian evolution basically said that the characteristics you acquired in your lifetime could then be passed on to offspring. And it did fit some things we knew or that was known at the time about evolution occurring that um, offspring tended to have some of these traits of their parents however there was a big flaw in it because we know now that acquired characteristics aren't passed on but it if that was the case then somebody who got a scar or or lost a limb then that would be passed on so it there was a lot of question even at the time about how this could even be possible since we knew that a lot of acquired things weren't passed on so the, the, the traditional thing you see with this is where the giraffe got his long neck by reaching down to take a drink and an alligator grabbed his, his head and pulled it stretched. And that's how a giraffe got, and then that was passed down and that's how giraffes got long necks. So there was all these theories and along came Darwin. And Darwin is a very interesting individual. Um, 
at the end of this slide I'll post a video that you can go watch it's a two hour long video however uh, the first 15 minutes is the most important 15 minutes but I actually recommend you watch this this two hour video it was a Nova special on PBS it's really fantastic into what happened with Darwin and how he came up with evolution and all that we're going to talk about the basics of it here but there's way too much to talk about in just a, a few minutes here so Darwin came along he was uh, a third generation uh, surgeon so his dad was a surgeon his grandpa was a surgeon he was planning on becoming a surgeon uh, it didn't work out for him because he the first time he saw blood in the operating theater he, he fled it and decided to never go back yeah you know, remember at these times we're talking about no anesthesia no pain anesthetics you're cutting people open while they can feel everything and and just some people couldn't deal with it and I know I wouldn't be able to deal with it uh, so he decided to go into seminary so he went to seminary school and part of that at least at the time people who went into seminary had to specialize in something so he specialized in geology um, and he, he basically got a good grounded education in the sciences he came from a well-to-do family so he had time for leisure and while his grandpa was and father were surgeons they were also uh, horse farmers they had a, a horse farm they bred horses and that's going to kind of lead back into some of the things that, that the way Darwin was raised and the way he ended up what he did so Darwin goes on this journey um, at the time uh, there were uh, explorers that were basically exploring or charting the the world and there was a ship called the Beagle that was going to basically map the coast of South America and at the time captains were were kind of a different class than the sailors and captains weren't allowed to co-mingle with the sailors they were the boss they weren't allowed to really talk to eat dinner with stuff like that well a voyage to go map the coast of South America is going to take a long time we're talking many months to years depending on how long it took them so what would often happen is captains would hire on a scientist from a well-to-do family who would basically be there to to do science things while they're on the trip but also to be a companion to the captain someone the captain can talk to have dinner with that type of thing so on for this one Darwin got um, employed Darwin got hired to go on the Beagle with the captain to basically be his dinner companion and he he learned a lot of things on this and it really started him thinking about things like evolutionary change so he came along he liked Lamarck's theory but he thought it was incomplete in scope so he wanted to explain a few things first he wanted to explain the mechanism of evolutionary change what is actually going on that's causing this or the the thing that is occurring for evolutionary change the next is the existence of purposeful structures why do eyes exist why do organs exist why are there different things like a beak on a bird why did these e exist when you're talking about in the context of evolution and then finally he was interested in the origin of species I, I should very much point out here origin of species does not mean origin of life evolution is not concerned with the origin of life the origin of life is something entirely different the origin of species however is how do species come about uh, popular theory at the time was religious in that it was all species were created at the beginning of creation and that's the way it was however based on travels and it was known long before this that species go extinct so if species go extinct the argument would then be well new species would would likely come about otherwise at the beginning of of time at the beginning of creation there would be so many different species that the world would be overcrowded so this this indications that there's this change that species speciation occurs so Darwin was interested in the origin of species
this is that video um check the slides without the the um lecture to get to it okay so what are the things that darwin got on his journey and as well as in his life that gave him clues to the actual mechanism for evolution well the first is darwin's famous finches so one of the places that the, the beagle stopped was the galapagos islands and the galapagos islands are really interesting in that they are pretty isolated from each other and they're isolated from the mainland so on these islands you've got each island had their own species so darwin collected birds from each of these islands and he, he thought he had a whole bunch of different um, types of birds. And when he got back, he actually went to someone who specialized in birds. And that person said, no, those were all just variations of finches. They were all different species of finches, even though they looked very different. Some had huge beaks, some had small beaks, some had long beaks, some had short beaks. They had different colors, all of this. So this was one of the indicators that he had that speciation occurred when you get this isolation like the different islands did. And he actually went a step further and found out that on islands that were dry, that only had like nuts and things like that, the, the finches there tended to have smaller, or well, not smaller, but shorter, stronger beaks because they needed to use those beaks to break open the nuts. However, the, the islands that had lots of flowers, the finches there had longer pointed beaks because they could get the nectar and stuff from the flowers. So each finch was actually well adapted to the island it was on. Another thing Darwin had going for him, and I already mentioned this kind of briefly, is horse breeding. So what went on here is that he, he learned from his, his family in, in years of horse breeding that some characteristics from the parents are passed on to the offspring, like Lamarck said, but it wasn't the acquired characteristics, it was the characteristics they were born with. So some color markings, size, different things like that of the parents are passed on. So he had this idea of passed on traits. And then he read a paper by Mathis that, that said that more organisms are produced than can survive and reproduce themselves. This leads to this struggle for existence. This is actually the origins of what is believed to be the, the survival of the fittest, even though Darwin didn't say, he, when he said survival of the fittest, he didn't mean it in the way we talk about it now. But this is the origins of that. And Darwin even did some calculations and one elephant who began reproducing at the age of 30 had one calf every 10 years and had six calves total. That doesn't seem like a lot. After 500 years, that one elephant would have 15 million descendants. So after just 500 years, we'd have 15 million elephants that are just a descendant of that one female elephant. So it stands to reason that if all offspring produced survived and reproduced themselves, then the world would be overrun with all the different species. We know now, we look at it that, that yes, a lot of um, young are, die of various different reasons. Even adults, especially prey animals, die of predation. Even predators die of things like starvation, not being able to get kills, things like that. So there's, in all species, there's this struggle for existence. So through this, and with a little bit, I, I'm not going to say help of Wallace. Wallace is another researcher. The interesting thing is, is he's not remembered, even though when uh, Darwin presented his work, Wallace co-presented because his work was basically, he found it independent of Darwin, all of this. Um, you don't hear about Wallace, though, because some of the things we're going to talk about later, Wallace disagreed with, and it turns out Darwin was right and Wallace was wrong about these other things. So it's it's more of the fact that Darwin was more was older, more prestigious, so he got a little bit more recognition from the beginning, but then even as time went on, um, Darwin kept publishing books that was based on this theory that, that he kept getting more and more things right, whereas Wallace got some things wrong. So what is this evolution by natural selection that Darwin came up with? There's three components to it. There will be an exam question on this. The first is that variability exists, that there is variance. We already talked about this, but this is the, the basically 
that different members of a species have different um, traits. Some people, let's talk about in humans, some people are taller than others, some people are shorter, some people have different colored hair, some people have different colored eyes. There's different levels of all these different traits. And, and there's just, there's a ton of different traits that we have variability on. So variance exists. Variability is passed on. This is the second one, and this is heredity. So some of the variability we have, not the acquired variability, even though we'll come back to epigenetics later and talk about how there might have even been, Lamarck might have even been onto a little something there, but that's besides the point here. The point here is variability is passed on. This is heredity. So your traits, your, your hair color, your eye color, it can be passed on. And some variants survive and reproduce better than others. And both of these are important, survival and reproduction. I'll talk about this later, but um, when we look at survival and reproduction, you, evolution doesn't occur if reproduction doesn't occur. Because the going back to this, the heredity doesn't occur if reproduction doesn't occur. But now this third thing, selection. That is that some variants survive and reproduce better than others. That means that some individuals based on their traits are able to survive better and are able to reproduce better. Let's talk about a wolf. A wolf that it has more stamina is more likely to survive. It's more likely to be able to chase down prey. A giraffe that has a longer neck is more likely to, to an extent, there's always trade-offs, but um, a, a giraffe that has a longer neck is able to eat more because they can get higher up in the trees eating so they are able to survive better that's the survival side then there's the reproduction side traits that aid in reproduction um, we'll talk later in the semester about things like sperm competition where you've got um, ejaculate size and that how that matters um, and how that aids in reproduction so some uh, variants survive lead to better survival and better reproduction chances. Therefore, those traits should be selected for because if the, the individual is, is surviving more, better and is reproducing more, then it will pass on those traits more. So when all three conditions are met, some variants will increase in the population, those traits that aid in survival and reproduction, and some will decrease those traits that hinder survival and reproduction in frequency. And this slow change in frequency in these traits over time is referred to by uh, referred to as evolution by natural selection. Sometimes you hear it as evolution by selection, but you just hear it as natural selection now. ENS or evolution by natural selection. So the slow change, and sometimes there's fast change, but it's generally a very slow change in frequencies over time is evolution by natural selection. And this is the basics of evolution as it pertains to biology. I'm not gonna go into the actual mechanics of it more than this. I'm not gonna go into things like gene genetic drift and all that, that kind of stuff. I, I just wanna, I'll talk about a few things, but I just wanna get out that this is the basics of evolution. So when we talk about things later this semester, this is what I'm referring back to. And I'm gonna come back up to the survival and reproduction thing too. And we'll probably talk about this a little bit more next week, but of the two of these, what is more important? And I've kind of already hinted it. Most people think it's survival. Most people think it's survival because we always talk about survival of the fittest and all of those things but that is actually not the case. What is more important is reproduction. I already said it, but evolution cannot occur without reproduction. If an organism survives for a million years but never reproduces, then evolution does not occur because they are not passing on their genes, they're not having offspring, evolution is not occurring. An organism can survive for one hour and reproduce, and evolution's occurring. That is because it reproduced, it passed on traits.
Survival is important because the longer an organism survives, the more opportunity it's going to have to reproduce. But of the two, reproduction is more important. Okay, let's talk about some misconceptions. So now that we've talked about some of the misconceptions about evolution, let's look at some of the other components of evolution. So one of the other components of evolution is something that actually caused Darwin no end of stress. So when Darwin published on the origin of species, he, he talked about evolution, he talked about all the different things, and he actually said in it, if, if someone can show instances that disproved it, he welcomed them because he wanted to, to make sure that he was right. Um, and But one of the things that actually um, gave him, actually he even said it straight up in, in one of his correspondence that kept him up night, at night was the peacock's tail. Because the peacock's tail, as far as it comes to evolution, doesn't seem to have an evolutionary advantage. Actually, it's, it's a pretty big evolutionary disadvantage. That is, it's easy for predators to grab. It's easy for parasites to get into. So what, it, there, and there's no actual physical advantage to it. It doesn't help it survive. It doesn't help it find food. So what is its advantage? And he, he through long thought came up with sexual selection. And this is actually one of the things him and Wallace differed on. Wallace didn't believe in sexual selection. Darwin did. Sexual selection actually turns out to be not only correct, but it's actually a, a very powerful component of natural selection. But sexual selection was defined by Darwin as the advantage of which certain individuals have over others of the same specs, sex and species in exclusive relation to reproduction. So this goes back to that thing I was talking about where I said that both survival and reproduction are important, but which one is more important? It is reproduction. Reproduction is more important. So what ends up happening is, is that sex, traits that aid in reproduction, not necessarily traits, they, they might even hinder survival, but traits that aid in reproduction will be selected for over traits that, not, that don't aid in reproduction, but aid in survival. So a peacock's tail is the perfect example. It is that um, indication, that, that sign to a, a female peahen that the, the peacock is strong enough, he, he, he is physically strong enough that even though he has this giant tail, he is physically strong enough to stay away from predators. And also, he has a good enough immune system to resist um, parasites because his tail is so so colorful. Peacocks with parasites, their tail isn't as colorful. Um, they, the feathers fall out, things like that. So this peacock, he, he's got a really strong immune system and he's strong enough and smart enough to stay away from predators. He's telling the female that. The female sees that and goes, oh, my offspring then will be strong enough and fast enough and have a good enough immune system. So she, she chooses him as a mate. So that this tail, even though it potentially hinders survival, it aids in reproduction. So... With sexual selection, the same three conditions must be met. You must have variants, you must have traits that are passed on, and there must be selection. The difference is, is that in sexual selection, the variants or traits that, that increase reproductive success are selected for in favor of traits that promote survival. Now, you can't have a, a trait that promotes um, reproduction so much that it costs the thing its life because again it still has to survive to reproduce but things that might actually hinder its survivability but really increase its reproduction will likely be selected for some common misunderstandings and misconceptions so we're going to talk about human first the, the first misconception is that human behavior is genetically determined. So the, the concept here is that if evolution is true, then our behavior is genetically determined. It's all based on our genes, that our environment is unimportant. Well, this is something we're going to talk about later, but it, it's just plain old not true. The evolutionary theory presents an interactionist framework. That is that um, evolved genetically based adaptations are based on or triggered by the environment. So you have these 
genetic predispositions that environment affects. So you see the two pictures here. Um, the top one, you've got calluses. So calluses are an adaptation. However, your calluses won't appear unless you have an environmental framework, an environment where the, the calluses are form, forced to appear. So if you work with your hands a lot, you'll get you'll form calluses on your hands. The next is the sunscreen. And we'll talk about skin tone a little bit in, in a few minutes, but um, sunscreen, not sunscreen, suntans. Not, not, I'm not talking about sunscreen, sorry. Suntans. Uh, sunscreen's beyond this. Suntans are something where um, it's an adaptation. You, Those who, especially with lighter skins, um, that are out in the sun will get tanned, which makes the skin more more resistant to the sun. And this is a genetics cause that, but you, you're not going to get that expressed without the environment. And we'll talk about skin tone more in a minute. The next is, if it's evolutionary, we can't change it. And this is also a myth because since genes and environment interact, if we don't like the evolutionary outcomes, we can change, we can alter the environment to, to alter the outcome. So this goes back to the calluses. Um, with the calluses, um, when, when you're looking at the calluses there, um, if we don't want calluses, we, we just don't use our hands. But even if you get calluses, you can use things like lotions that'll reduce them. You can do other things. So you can change the environment and you change the outcome. And that's one of the reasons um, why, and I'll say it here, the better we understand our involved psychological mechanisms and how they interact with the environment, the greater our, pro our power to create desirable outcomes. It's why I always teach evolution in all of my classes. This is one of those classes you can't get around teaching it, but I teach evolution in all of my classes uh, because of this huge point right here. The better we understand the mechanism, the better we understand the why and the what causes it, the better we can ha change the outcome if we want a better outcome or a different outcome. So it's really important to study evolution to get to that point where you can figure out the why and the what and potentially change it for the better. Humans have a lot of deleterious traits. Humans have a lot of um, traits that are very bad. And a lot of it is due to an environmental mismatch. So this is another component of evolution is evolution occurred in the past. Evolution is occurring today but who we are is due to the evolutionary pressures of the past. It's not due to the pressures of the present, it's due to the pressures of the past. So the evolutionary pressures of the past shaped who we are today. I'll actually talk about that a little bit on the next slide. That is that current mechanisms are optimally designed. This is actually a myth. Our current me mechanisms are not necessarily optimally de designed um, because our current mechanisms represent adaptations to the past. It's adaptations to past environments. Uh, the current environment, if it differs substantially from our previous ones, it means the mechanisms may not, that it were great, that were all outstanding, that were very adaptive, that were very beneficial in previous environments, that they are no longer beneficial. They can actually be deleterious. They can harm us because of this environmental change. So it's what's called an environmental mismatch. So for this, one of the, the key ones I talk about is candy, sugars. So with, with um, sugar, when our desire to eat sugar evolved, the environment was such that, that sugars were hard to come by. You might be able to get fruits and things like that to get sugars, but they would be rare. They would be hard to get and they are very high in calories. So if you're you're in the past and you, the sugars are rare, but they're high in calories and you're always on the edge of potential starvation and you come across sugars, it should be you should have a strong desire to eat all the sugars, to take in all of those calories. It would be very beneficial. 
So in our past environment, we would have evolved traits that would have gave us great desire to eat sugars. However, now we're in an entirely different environment. We're in an environment where you can go to any corner store and, and get sugar. You can get aisles and aisles of sugar. You can get so much sugar that you basically become obese on the sugar. So this is a perfect example of how our current mechanisms are not optimally designed. This over desire for sugar was great in the past. It is not so great now. Here's another example of mechanisms that are not optimally designed. That's skin tone, skin color. So I talked about how I was going to come back to this, but if all I have, if if all adaptations were or all mechanisms were optimally designed, our skin color would be our skin tone would be perfect for our environment. However, it's not. Why is it not? Because one of the big things is is that all adaptations that we have out there have costs. Some of the costs are are so minimal that they're they're negligible. Some of the costs are great. Skin tone is a a perfect example here because um, the the lighter skin we have we there's benefits but there's deficits the darker skin we have there's benefits but there's also deficits so for example dark skin is very protective against the sun dark skin you don't uh you you don't burn if you go out in the sun it, people with darker skin have even though they do have chances of getting skin cancer their chances of getting skin cancer is much lower than those with lighter colored skin. That's because those with lighter colored, colored skin can easily be damaged by the sun. So you might ask the question, why don't we all, all have darker colored skin then? It would be, if it's a benefit to have darker colored skin, you have less chance of cancer, less chance of dying from it, less chance of getting um, sun poisoning from an overly powerful sunburn, stuff like that. We don't all have darker skin because of this right here because all adaptations have cost. The cost of darker skin is a less ability for the skin to absorb vitamin D from the sun. So the, we get a lot of our vitamin D from the sun. It's our primary source of getting vitamin D. And the darker your skin, the harder your skin has a time has, has of absorbing vitamin D. In environments where it is very, very sunny, where it is just all kinds of sun, all kinds of heat, all of that. Um, in those types of environments, even having darker skin, you're going to absorb enough vitamin D. However, in environments where part of the year there's no sun at all, like the, the Scandinavian countries, Northern Europe, that type of thing, where you have months out of the year where there might only be a few hours of sun. And not only that, you got to bundle up in a lot of clothes because it's so cold. So in those places, you're not going to be absorbing vitamin D as easily. So having a lighter colored skin is an advantage because the sun that you do get, it's easier to absorb vitamin D from. So this is where you get that trade off. There's advantages to darker colored skin. That is that it's more protective against the sun, but there's also disadvantages. That is that there's a less lower chance of absorbing vitamin D. There's advantages to lighter colored skin. That is you absorb vitamin D better, but there's also disadvantages. That is that you don't have that protective layer against the sun. So when we look at this, we see this trade off you have. So that's why um, different people in different environments historically in our past, when these traits evolved, had different color skins. Now, we are in a much different environment now. So this goes back to the current mechanisms are optimally designed. That is, the people are inside more. That means those with darker colored skins aren't getting enough vitamin D. Um, people move. So people from uh, areas where there's a lot more sun move to areas where there's less sun. People from areas where there's less sun move to areas where there's more sun. So in you get these environmental mismatches showing that these current mechanisms aren't optimally designed. Another example of current mechanisms being not optimally designed is, and this is very important, natural selection does not have foresight. Natural selection cannot see the future. 
Natural selection only works on the best solution that was available at the time. It usually finds solutions or traits that are just better than other ones currently in the population, not necessarily the best one. So you'll get traits that, that are, are good, but not great, simply because the, the, the trait that is great never appeared. So the one that's good, which was better than the one that was okay, which is better than the one that was bad, the one that's good is more likely to be passed on. Like, and a perfect example of that is um, the, the human eye, or actually all vertebrate eyes. So one thing interesting about the eyes is, is we know of eight distinct evolutions of the eyes in living things. Uh, mammals, not mammals, vertebrates is one of those evolutions. But when you look at things like um, octopi, they have a different evolution. When you look at various different insects, they have different evolutions of eyes. So there's at least eight different evolutions of eyes that we know. But in vertebrates, one of the big problems with the vertebrate eye is there's a blind spot. This optic nerve where it comes in in the back causes a blind spot in our vision. Now this isn't a, as big of a deal, but it is still, when you consider about it, consider it for prey animals to have a spot in their vision that something could potentially sneak up on them on, and to that split second that it's in their blind spot could cost them their life. So because of this, it's, it's definitely not optimally designed. Optimally designed would be to have no blind spot, such as like with mollusks, the squids and octopi, their, their retina is in front of the optic nerve, thus they have no blind spot. So it's, it's and then there, even theirs isn't necessarily optimally designed, but it's better than the human eye and the vertebrate eye. However, the vertebrate eye is the way it is because that was what was best at the time. The other example is by far my favorite example. This is the one that, that it just shows that um, mechanisms, there's some, that evolution did occur in that, that it, it did occur because we can show how poorly designed something like the recurrent laryngeal nerve is. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve starts at the back of the brain here and goes to the front of the brain here. However, the recurrent version of it, so the superior goes straight through. This is the superior here that you see. The superior goes straight. It's a very short thing, a few inches, sometimes up to four or five inches. In, in some mammals, it's it would be less than an inch. However, the recurrent laryngeal nerve goes all the way down under the aortic arch and back up to the to the throat to the larynx and and why is it doing that that is because when this nerve first evolved it evolved in fish um, ancestor all the way back to to fish and in those fish it the the or at least the ancestors of modern fish ancestors of all mammals as well but back before there was mammals back to fish um, it went straight because the fish's head is shaped in such a way. You've got the fish head. I'm not a great artist, but you got the fish head. Um, the brain would have been here, the current laryngeal nerve here, the aortic arch would have been here, and it would have gone straight through. So it would have still gone around the aortic arch, but it would have gone around it pretty much a straight shot. And what ended up happening is, is that as mammals evolved, the heart sunk into the chest cavity away from the head. And this is where the, the laryngeal nerve that was wrapped around the, the aortic arch that comes off the heart, it pulled down into the chest cavity. So you get this nerve that's really long. And this nerve, if it gets cut, neck injury, it can cause serious damage, if not death. So it's something that is very important. The one of the, the so it descends, I already said all this. One of the, the great examples of this is it would be like driving from Detroit to Ann Arbor, but going to Toledo. So instead of going straight from Detroit to Ann Arbor, you go down 75 and come back up 23. It, it's definitely not the optimal way to do it. 
and the the prototypical the one that's the the biggest example modern example we have of this is the giraffe it, it was even worse than some dinosaurs that had super long necks but the giraffe is a modern animal we have where we can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve that goes all the way from the back of the brain here all the way down into the chest cavity below the aortic arch all the way back to here where it's something that could be a few inches long and instead it is a dozen feet or more long and this is again the perfect example of showing evolution in practice where they, they the evolution occurred because it was the best option present not necessarily the optimal option let's transition now into genetics so we are going to talk about a basic overview of Gendel Mendelian heredity which is our basics or our earliest stuff on genetics so Mendel yeah, he was publishing papers he actually was was around at the same time as Darwin he'd actually wrote a paper on this that was on Darwin's desk they found it on Darwin's desk when Darwin died but um, Darwin hadn't cut it up yet so what Darwin did is whenever he read and understood a paper he would cut it up just to show that he'd read it he'd, he'd put a cut in um the the paper from Mendel hadn't had been cut even though it was on his desk so either Darwin didn't read it or he he had read it and didn't understand it because it is a very math heavy paper very technical math heavy um so what it comes down to is is if Darwin had read it and understood it it would have supported a lot of what he was saying about evolution so Men Mendel he he studied um a specific type of flower but he basically found that if you had um two parents in the flower and if you bred them together a white one and a red one that you would get a basic mix on average of offspring 25% would be red 25% would be white and 50% would be pink now this is actually a bit unusual when it comes to genetics because this is what's called incomplete dominance so um a dominant trait is one that is is we'll come back to this but a dominant trait is one that is inherited when impaired with a recessive trait a recessive trait is only inherited when it's paired with another recessive trait incomplete dominance is when you get a mix of the two traits for the majority of traits for almost all traits you do not get incomplete dominance you don't have a mix you either have a dominant trait or a recessive trait but regardless of that Mendo was on the right track he actually came came up with this and very complicated math that he put in it basically saying that you take traits from each parent and a certain percentage of offspring are going to have the trait from the father and a certain percentage are going to have the trait from the mother and in this case a certain percentage are going to have a mix but that showed that that there was something going on that was basically leading to these traits and each parent was essentially contributing equal so looking at um, the genetic code so you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes so each parent contributes 23 chromosomes 46 total to get you your 23 pairs so we each have 23 pairs we got one of the pairs one set of pairs one set of the pairs so one set of 23 is from our mother and one set of 23 is from our father now there's more to it than that if you want to get into complex stuff you can take a biology class and they'll talk about the fact that because of crossing over and recombination and all that fun stuff that that is actually fun it's exciting it's it's interesting how this all works but because of all that you get the the there's times where it's not exact where you have exactly 23 from each because there's things that occur that can basically from one of your parents it can actually cross over to the chromosome from the other it's really weird but it's really interesting so our first 22 pairs are called our autosomes and then the final pair is what determines the sex of the child and we're talking about biological sex here a males carry xy they get the x from the mother and the y from the father 
and females carry XX, the X from the mother and the X from the father. So it is the male's sperm that determines the, the gender of the offspring. We will talk later about things actual female's body can do to base to help pick the gender, but it still comes down to if it's an X sperm, it, it makes for a female offspring. If it's a Y sperm, it makes for a male offspring. But we'll talk about that interesting stuff later where you can get kind of the mother isn't just passive in this process. It's it's not a conscious thing. It's definitely a, a, a thing that's happening automatically in the body, but the mother's had the mother and the mother's womb does have some selection in the offspring. So alleles, alleles are basically the the easiest way to explain it. It's 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 much more co complex than this as a bunch of, as many of the things are here, but we're trying to keep it simple. So alleles are what carry the they're parts of the chromosome that carry genetic information for a specific trait. You get alleles. There's different alleles for each trait. Some traits only have two alleles. Some traits actually only have one, and you're going to get the same from both parents. Some traits have two alleles. Some traits have dozens of alleles. Um, things like um, the, the main uh, allele for eye color, the main thing that r works on eye color, even though there's a lot of different genes that work on eye color. Um, so the alleles, you get one from each parent, and however they, they work out, um, Whichever ones you get determine your traits. And I, I already talked about with this dominant and recessive. We'll talk that about that a little bit more on the next slide. But if you get homozygous alleles, that means you're getting the same from the both parents. Both parents have contributed the same, and that's what you'll have as an outcome. However, if you have heterozygous alleles, it means the parents have contributed different versions of the traits, and your outcome trait or different alleles um, for the trait and your outcome of that trait will depend on dominance and recessiveness of the, the alleles. Okay, for some reason that didn't load up before, but it's loaded up now. You should have it all now. It's everything I just said. Okay, so when we're talking about that, when we're talking about that dominant and recessive, so we get one pair of genes from the mother, one pair from the father. A dominant trait will be expressed when it's paired with some with a recessive. Now there there's going to be obviously um, it's it's a way more complex than this, but in general, if a dominant is paired with a recessive, the dominant is expressed. If a dominant is paired with a dominant, it's expressed. If a recessive tr gene trait is present, it will only be expressed when it is paired with another recessive gene for that trait. So two recessives will then display the recessive. And finally, incomplete dominance is when there's a mix of the traits, as I was talking about with Mendel there. So let's talk a little bit about genes. I kind of mentioned this before, but um, when we're talking about genes, uh, Early on, people thought that, that the genetic code um, was basically full of a bunch of dead genes. Uh, what is not dead genes, and when I say dead genes, I mean genes that don't do anything, inactive. Active genes are genes that have an active expression on the phenotype of the individual. On the next slide, we'll talk about what that word phenotype means. But it basically means the expression of genes. Regulator genes, on the other hand, are genes that control the expression of active genes. So a lot of those inactive genes that, that people thought were on the, the genetic code are actually regulator genes. Other ones are inactive, but they're not inactive because they don't do anything, as a lot of people originally thought. They're inactive because uh, they, they are relating to epigenetics. We'll talk about epigenetics on the slide later, but epigenetics is a how the environment can affect genes and turn on and off genes. Let's talk about those words genotype and phenotype. 
I talked, I mentioned phenotype on the previous slide, but genotype and phenotype, it's very good to understand the difference of these. Your genotype is your inherited traits. It is important to know it is not the traits you, you necessarily express. Your genotype is your inherited traits. It's the traits you got from your parents. Your phenotype, on the other hand, so your genotype is your genes. That's an easy way to say it. Your genotype is your genes. Your phenotype, on the other hand, is your expressed traits. Your phenotype is the traits that you actually have. Your genotypes is the traits you can have because it's your genes. The phenotype is the traits you actually have, the traits you actually express. So if you've got a genotype for, let's say, to be tall, um, and then you're, you end up um, short, tall, it doesn't matter. Your genotype is to be tall. Your phenotype is what you actually end up being because your phenotype is a mixture of the your genes, your genotype, and your environment. If you don't get proper nutrition as a kid, then even if you've got a genotype to be tall, you're going to likely be short. But if you get good nutrition, everything works out great, your phenotype ends up coming pretty close to your genotype and you end up tall. So gene expression, activation of particular genes, particular cells at particular times, that happens due to environmental influences. I absolutely love this side slide so we have reaction range reaction range is a term that that i just find fascinating so reaction range refers to in a sense the difference between phenotype and genotype these dashed lines that you see down here that i'm pointing the arrows to these dashed lines are a person's phenotype their exact expressed traits the line that you see in color purple red and green unless you're colorblind the genotype a b and c are a person's genotype that is their genetics that is the 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 genetics they have so as you can see each of these has a difference between their genetic the genotype and their their expressed phenotype and the reaction range is that difference that difference between genotype and phenotype okay let's transition a little bit into some types of inheritance um, or specifically just one uh, so when we're talking about uh, traits there are some traits that we have that are generally expressed by one pair of genes. So, but that being said, those are actually very rare. Those are the exception, not the norm. The norm is that we get have what's called polygenetic inheritance. That is that many pairs of genes affect a trait. Things like even our eye color are affected by multiple pairs of genes, even hair color, but definitely things like intelligence, height, weight, personality, um, susceptibility to various different psychological disorders, susceptibility to cancer. These are, aren't influenced by one gene, they're influenced by many. So if you take a test like on 23andMe and they come back and they're testing one specific trait, they're testing one specific gene, one spe their alleles on, for one specific gene, and they say that you've got a specific um, allele, you're, you're less likely to get cancer. You've got a specific allele, you're more likely to get cancer. What they're really saying is one of the many genes that influences your ability to get cancer is either negative or positive for changing that. So it does influence your ability to or your likelihood of getting cancer but it isn't the end all it isn't everything because there's many other genes that are contributing to this let's just hit on chromosomal abnormalities just real quick um, we'll do a slide on this and then a slide on on genetic counseling um, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about development later, when we talk about developmental abnormalities later. But um, there's a few specific ones to consider. 
chromosomal, chromosomal abnormalities that can occur when there's um, errors in chromosome division. Um, Down syndrome is when there's a third 21st chromosome. You've got Turner syndrome, where, which is a female born with a single X chromosome. And this will typically cause her, it, basically in almost all cases, will cause her to be sterile and not develop in the same way. Kleinfelter is a male born with more than one X chromosome. So Kleinfelter, um, they're, they're in a sense, when we're saying male and female here, it is the biological sex they're closest to. However, they aren't necessarily one or the other. Um, so with Kleinfelter syndrome, because there's two X's and a Y, um, individuals with this will have a penis, but typically it will be smaller, um, not as developed, and they may develop breasts. Um, you have fragile X. Fragile X is where one arm of the X is, is only barely connected. So when things like this happen, um, it can cause issues close to Turner, stuff like that. Uh, so there's just, these are the issues. You notice most of these other than Down syndrome and other ones we'll talk about later are almost all on the sex link chromosomes, the X and Y chromosome. That's because uh, it's easier for evolution to select against chromosomal abnormalities that are not on the sex chromosome. The ones on the sex chromosome are, are closely linked to um, the sex differences. Therefore, other things, they, they an error in, in part of it it's it's going to still possibly get selected for because of it's so closely linked to the other sex link traits. There's also genetic counseling. We'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's a service that helps people understand and adapt to implications of genetic contributions to disease. People uh, uh, can find out, especially if they're a carrier of a specific genetic disease, they can find out if they their children have it while they're still in the womb and they can make decisions based on that, especially when they can find that out early. I'm not going to get into the whole abortion issue. I'm just going to say that genetic counseling, genetic diagnosis and counseling is one of the things that people have as an option to figure out if there's something wrong with the baby before the baby is even that far along in uh, fetal development. Let's go back to nature versus nurture real quick and we'll talk about this for just a couple slides when we're going to talk about heritability of traits. So nature versus nurture, we are now going to look at what's called concordance rates. Concordance rates are really interesting in that they're statistical calculations used to estimate the degree to which heredity and environment account for individual differences in a trait of interest. So what basically concordance rates are is if we talk about the concordance rate of a specific trait, we are talking about the percentage of that trait that's influenced by the environment and the percentage of that trait that's influenced by genetics. So a trait is heritable, if highly heritable, if the concordance rates are higher for more genetically related than less genetically related pairs of people. This is where the twin studies come in. And it uses a correlation coefficient. It's used when the trait can be present in varying degrees. And it ranges from zero to one, with zero meaning the trait has no heritability, one meaning the trait is 100% heritable, that the environment is going to have no effect on the trait. Again, zero is when the trait is 100% environmental and genetics have no effect. There's basically no traits that are zero and one, are very, very few. Most are a mixture of the two somewhere in the middle. An example is IQ. So IQ actually has a heritability right about in the middle. It's right around 0.5, meaning that 50% of our, our variability in intelligence comes from genetics and 50% comes from the environment. So genetic differences account for 50% of variation and environment accounts for 50%. That being said, here's some interesting things. There are times where we can take this heritability and throw it out the window. That is because certain environmental extremes will affect heritability more than others. For most individuals, IQ is 50% heritable. 
meaning you're any wherever you're at on it 50 percent came from your environment stimulation all of that 50 percent came from your genetics however in individuals who have very, who grew up in very harsh environments who grew up in environments where there's lack of nutrition where there is constant abuse things like that those very harsh environments actually will will just throw genetics out the window and those individuals tend to have very low iqs so it is something to consider when you're talking about this when you're considering these concordance rates it, just be aware that there are times where even something that is highly heritable that that heritability can get thrown out the window based on uh specific environments especially harsh environments let's look at some other traits so some traits that are strongly heritable are things like eye color height and weight so whatever height and weight your parents are you're likely to be not guaranteed especially if they had nutrition problems when they were younger or you had nutrition problems when you're younger eye color is pretty much you're pretty much going to get it from your parents there are exceptions you can always have mutations you can always have issues you can always have weird combinations but generally eye color is pretty fixed um, physiological function like measured brain activity reactions to alcohol if you if you you're lightweight and you, you or you get angry when you have alcohol when you drink alcohol those are the types of things you can blame your parents for uh, levels of physical activity susceptibility to certain diseases these are highly heritable some that are moderately heritable we just talked about it general intelligence this is about 50 percent there's others but we're not going to get into them and then finally things that are less heritable are going to be things like temperament and personality susceptibility to many psychological disorders not all but many are less heritable environment has a greater effect that being said, there is still heritability in them. It's just environment has a greater effect. Let's look at some terms real quick about gene environment correlations. First, you've got what are referred to as passive gene environment correlations. So when we're talking about heritability, we're talking about the mixture of gene and environments. Well, let's look at how those kind of interact. So with passive gene environment interactions, the parents are providing both the genes and the environment for their children and what ends up happening is is that the even if something isn't as heritable it still tends to occur because the parents are providing an environment based on their genes and that that same environment and the genes are being provided to the offspring so the offspring grows up in a similar environment and with similar genes is likely to have similar outcomes evocative gene environment correlations though are when uh, genotypically different individuals elicit different responses from their environment so these are people who have different genetics different genes but are in the same environment well what ends up or a similar environment they end up what ends up happening is is they have different responses it's because the environment is affecting their genes in different ways even if it's the same environment and finally active gene environment correlations are correlations that occur because individuals select context they find stimulating and rewarding so what ends up happening here is again you might have a specific genetic code you become an adult you've got specifically specific gene genetic predispositions and you choose environments that actually go along with your genetic predispositions therefore making those genetics more heritable rather than escaping or changing the environment people do change the environment and choose environments that are very different than their genetics someone who's extroverted may choose an environment that's more introverted more solitary someone who's introverted may choose an environment that's more outgoing and extroverted like how and more sociable however a person who is extroverted is usually going to choose the outgoing and a person who's introverted is usually going to choose the solitary there's more to it than that extroverted and not introverted aren't exactly that but you kind of you should get my point next i want to talk about life history theory because i love talking about life history theory it is one of my favorite things to talk about um 
Life history theory is basically how early life environmental factors affect later life outcomes in an individual. So with this, these early life factors like stress, attachments, change in future father figure, availability of resources, SES, indicators of mortality, these are all types of things that affect later life outcomes like age at puberty, age at first sexual encounter, age at first offspring, aggressive tendencies, risk taking, and mate guarding. Now, I talked about this earlier, so I'm not going to go into it more now. Just know that it's, it's one of those that these early life factors can change a person's phenotype. They change the genetic expression that a person has. They can change all the way down from that change in father figure in, in the first two years of life for a girl changes the age that she hits puberty can change it by up to two years. It's just one of those very fascinating outcomes. And that leads to epigenetics. And epigenetics is again, how basically the genetic code um, and, and those dead genes, what was thought to be dead genes, actually activate based on the environment. So the environment causes, so, the, a, a better detailed description of that is um, our, our DNA, uh, basically proteins and other things are made from DNA. Um, they copy to it, DNA splits and things copy to it and split off and then the DNA comes back together. The things that copy to it and split off are, are the different things that are created in the body like proteins. Um, there's more to it than that, but that is the basics of it. Um, if the DNA is too close together, things can't form on it. If they're far enough apart, things can form on it. So one of the ways the, the genes turn on and off is by scrunching the DNA closer together or farther apart. If something in the environment changes the genetic code, it, what it'll do is it'll stretch that section of DNA out or scrunch that section of DNA together. So epigenetics is how the environment affects genes and these changes can be passed on to offspring up to three generations. So very interesting stuff. Okay, so in this chapter we covered evolution by natural selection. We looked at some other aspects of evolution. We finished up with genetics and we tied it back into development. Thanks, come on back.